Namo tassa pegawato arahato samma sambudasa. Honor to the sublime one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Uh, yeah, I guess you could call it a Dhamma teaching. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I see some new names, so I will um, give an introduction. Yes. Uh, my name is Jayantha. Uh, formerly known here as Ferox. I've been on staff at the Buddha Center for about two years. I'm a 34-year-old lay Buddhist disciple of the Theravada tradition. Uh, lay Buddhist means I'm not a monk, I'm not a master, guru, or anything like that. Uh, I'm just a regular Buddhist on his path, and uh, I come here to share what I know with those uh, who are new to the practice and to discuss. And if you're familiar with a normal uh, Dhamma talk done by monks. Um, we follow the same kind of setup where there's a talk in the beginning and then question and answer after. However, normally when you do a, um, a talk with the monk, they ask that you hold off your questions or comments until after the, the monk is done talking. With me, since I like to have a little bit more of a discussion and I'm not a monk, never feel like you're going to interrupt me or, or anything like that if I'm talking, if you want to make a comment or have a question or anything like that. Some of the best talks, Dhamma talks, here on uh, Tuesday nights have been actual discussions where everybody has put in, um, you know, comments and, and uh, debated, uh, as it were. And I think tonight's topic is one that I've actually never talked about before. And I think this will... Um, uh, garner some questions and some talk. So, <clears throat> tonight's topic is one of the most simple when it comes to Buddhism. However, yet, for especially Westerners coming to Buddhism, it's one of the most thought of, thought about, and complicated, and that is re-becoming. And you say, re-becoming? What the heck is that? <laughs> otherwise known as rebirth or reincarnation. <laughs> so I wanted to start out that because there's a difference. There's many, many cultures across the planet that believe in what we is commonly called reincarnation. There's a difference though between Buddhism and basically all the rest. <laughs> And that's why in Buddhism we call what we would normally call rebirth or reincarnation, we call it becoming or re-becoming. Going to the term reincarnation, what that is, um, incarnate, the, uh, if you go to the roots, and this is how it's been explained to me by different monastics, the original meaning is like a a soul, a permanent soul going from one body to the next, right? And the same thing with rebirth. The so in Hinduism, um, and many many different cultures, and you know, ironically enough, there are more people on this planet that believe in re reincarnation than do uh, one life. Interestingly enough, and we'll talk about that too, but. Um, there is no <coughs> considered no permanent self, no permanent soul in Buddhism. So that way, that is the reason why we don't use rebirth or reincarnation. If you know anything, or if you've heard, um, studied the 12 steps of dependent origination in the past, you know that becoming is actually one of those steps. And becoming is actually that period of time before the child is is born. It's that period of time where what they call the relinking consciousness travels from the last consciousness of the previous uh, person to the next consciousness of the new person. And this is all complicated and stuff, and I don't, I can't really talk in depth about it because I'm really learning about it myself. But we don't necessarily need to go in depth about it. What I wanted to talk about specifically is 
Westerners, like myself, like I'm sure many of you, most of you are probably Westerners, whether European or American, we've probably come to Buddhism through the lens of a previous religion. I know I have. And when you come from a, the lens of a previous religion or a previous belief, and you have, you totally reject it. Oh, this is, you know, so especially, you know, I, I don't, I'm agnostic. I have never been the type that I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that. I don't know what's true. So I basically just. You know, there could be a God, there could be many gods, there could be rebirth, there could be reincarnation, there could be a soul, there might not be a soul. Who knows? <laughs> um, you can only know what you can see and what you can experience. That's the only thing you can know. So for me, it's always been, I don't know, I've always had an open mind. Now, there's some people who might be atheists, and they say, oh, there's no God, there's a, all these fairy tales, and this and that, and they come to Buddhism, and they're thinking, oh, Buddhist meditation, you know, all of these things that connect with them, and that make sense to them, because it's experience-based, but then it goes to, oh, rebirth, a reincarnation, and then that's when, like, the, the old... The, the, the old feelings come on. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, now, now I can't even escape this in Buddhism because now they got rebirth and they got devas and yakas. Devas are the deities, like kind of like angels. Yakas are the demons. You got all these things. And so we kind of come up with, with what today would be considered, um, uh, what is it called? I want to say sectional, but that's not what it is. <laughs> but it's not religious. What, what's the term? I'm, I'm trying to remember. It begins with an S. Um, secular, that's it. Thank you. So now you have this, this secular Buddhism that kind of picks and chooses what they think works. And they, they just kind of either gloss over. Some people actually even claim that the Buddha never even taught reincarnation. Although... I will say one thing, that's 100% true, because he never, he taught re-becoming. <laughs> but, there's, um, you know, so th there's this, this feeling for Westerners to kind of, they see this core that is fitting, that makes sense. But they see these externalities, like rebirth, like karma, and they, and it confuses them or they don't want to deal with it and they just kind of push it to the side. Now, the best part about this is the Buddha basically said to do that. <laughs> you may be familiar with the Kalama Suttas. This is the sutta where these, um, the Kalamas, there's the, this group of people and they come to the Buddha and they say there's a lot of different teachers and a lot of different religions and they're all teaching all these kind of things and you know what do you think is the is the way we should follow or how do you think is the way we should analyze all of these teachings to find out which one is the right one and so the Buddha goes over all of these different um, you know all of these different parts of what this is how you should analyze this or you know if 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 this tradition has this then this is good etc and from that sutta comes one of the most famous and often misquoted and misunderstood paragraphs about the um, not believing something just because you've heard it or because your teacher said it or because um, you know it's well known or because you read it in a book and all these kind of things so that's that sutta that this is coming from but most people who are not familiar with the sutta they don't know they haven't read all the way to the bottom and this is where the Buddha is talking about the Buddha basically says this if there is no afterlife if there is no rebirth the practice of Dhamma brings benefit here and now if there is rebirth and karma then the practice of Dhamma 
you are doubly rewarded because it helps you in a better rebirth in the future. So if you want to extrapolate that into modern times, if there's a heaven, if there's rebirth, if there's whatever, okay, living a moral life, meditating, that's good. That'll Maybe it'll help you in the afterlife if there is one. If there isn't, you lived a good life. You helped people. You lived morally. You, you improved yourself. So, what's the point? What's the difference, right? <laughs> so th- this is the Buddha is always talking about the present moment. You're not. You're in this life, whether there's another life or not. In in reality, really doesn't matter at all. Because if you're worried about future lives, you're not in the present, being mindful, creating that positive and good future so always remember this if you <clears throat> if you feel like this is something like oh you have to you have to believe in rebirth or uh, rebecoming to be a Buddhist or to practice that's not necessarily true now some of the more advanced teachers they talk about and the Buddha himself talked about as you advance in the practice being able to see and to, to know past lives well, you know, that's an exper- that's something that's through your own experience. And I guess if I ever got to that point where I could see my past lives, then it would be like, well, it's not something to believe in or not to believe in. It's, it's reality. It's right there. So I'm not, that, I'm not to that point yet. <laughs> so for me, although it's something that I've always, since I was a kid, I've gr- I grew up in a very Catholic um, world, really. And, you know, I was very very strict Catholic family I was never really taught about any other traditions, religion or anything like that but I always felt an affinity to rebirth to reincarnation to rebecoming uh, for some reason I always felt it was it was right it made sense to me and even to this day I still feel that way I can't prove it in any way I can't Debating it would be silly. Well, I mean, it's like, what? How much more of a silly debate can you get between somebody who would debate that there is an afterlife of some sort and there isn't an afterlife? What are you gonna get? That's kind of like pounding your heads against the wall, not really <laughs> getting anywhere. You could do it for five or six lifetimes and not get anywhere. So that's why the Buddha is like, don't worry about that stuff. Practice, 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 practice. That's what the Buddha said. And that's what all of my teachers say too. <laughs> and that's what I say because that's what I found to be the most important thing. So as we talk about this <clears throat> larger um, topic of rebecoming or becoming or however you want to say it, just keep that in mind. That don't feel that it's something that you have to believe in. Or that you even have to think about. Because in all reality it has no real bearing on your present moment in this life. How you remain in the present moment. How you live skillfully. You make skillful decisions. Living a moral, a good life. Meditating. Concentrating. Advancing in your practice which is really of course just letting go there's really no advancing in the practice so the more you're able to do this if there's an afterlife if there's a rebirth okay that's fine I was good if there isn't I lived a good life I'm happy so for me even you know those of you who know like uh, Liberty Charlemagne the, the evil you guys know that I'm somebody who is actually moving towards becoming a monastic and you think, is there such thing as a, a Buddhist monk who doesn't believe in, in rebirth or reincarnation? And I'm going to say, yes, there actually is. I've met some. <laughs> Ironically enough. It does, e- even as a monk, it's not something, there's, there's no dogma that says you have to believe in this. You know, this is something that you have to do. So keep that in mind. 
Now, one of the things, and one of the reasons why this topic has come up is because I found, um, I've started reading some books, and they, and it's been interesting. When, when you, like, if you go online, right, and you, and you do a search of monastics talking about rebirth or reincarnation or proof of reincarnation, there's one name that will always come up, always. And that is Professor Ian Stevenson. Does anybody have anybody heard of Ian Stevenson or read anything by Professor Ian Stevenson? Anything? Okay. I believe he's dead. And I will provide a link. I believe he's dead. Probably just very recently. But this gentleman has been basically the only person well now there's more people that since since then since you know he he actually did this work this is the person who for the last 40 years worked on the what he considers the only close to possible proof of rebirth and that is he found this and, and not you know it's interesting because when you read his stuff, he's very scientific. It's not like quasi science or like wackadoodle kind of stuff. I mean, his book's very, very dry. Very dry, talking about a lot of methodology, but the stories themselves are amazing. And what he found was that the most provable of all the proof and quotations that is any kind of that there is any kind of rebirth is through children who spontaneously speak of and remember previous lives not going to a site and he talks about all these other ways that people say that they know previous lives including actually meditation and he basically kind of like debunks them he says there's really no proof there's no there's really no you know there's no other way that in these, like going to a psychic, a past life psychic, or anything like that. He's like, there's, there's no way to even to put any kind of scientific method on these. So there's no way to prove them. However, he's able to put the scientific method on proving these cases. And this is a case now. And this is something that I've I've been reading, and it's interesting. And this is kind of from what I've been reading, this is what they put in in terms of a typical case. Typical case is a two or a three year old starts talking about you're not my mom, you're not my dad. Or they start talking about I died this way. And they start saying things that actually become verifiable. You know, I was th this person. Or this person is my dad. And they can go, and they have in these cases, gone across a country or across you know whatever even sometimes a town over and they've found that these this is the family of this person who this this child claims to have been and the child goes over to this new family and he knows all the people and he knows all these intimate details that nobody could possibly know and so it's really fascinating it's like wow like you know even Ian Stevenson never says oh yeah there's rebirth or reincarnation he doesn't even necessarily say that this is 100% proof of it, but he basically says, well, this is verifiable. What else can it be? And so it's, if you're interested in it at all, if you're interested in learning what kind of proof, if, there's any kind of, if there is any such thing as proof with regard to rebirth, this is about as close as you're ever going to get to proof. So if you're really fascinated about it or wanting to learn about this proof in parentheses <clears throat> I highly suggest it and I'll give you a, a link to some of his stuff um, I actually got two books I got one of his books like I said is very scientific very dry and I got a book um, called Old Souls Compelling Evidence from Children Who Remember Past Lives this is not by Ian Stevenson however this is a book by the only person who was ever allowed to go out and into the field with him and do case studies and stuff and this was um, a journalist who you know he talks about how starting out being very um, 
you know, very skeptical and wanting to go out and disprove him and then going out and talking to the kids and, and kind of being like, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> so it's kind of fascinating. Yeah. The, if you look on YouTube, actually, it's probably a bunch of stuff for me and Stevenson anyway. But you know what? For me, in all honesty, I just go back to that Kalama Sutta. You know, it's it's interesting. It's kind of fascinating to, to read these things, but does it really help me in my daily life? No, it doesn't. You know, I mean, fear of a, a S-U-T, well, S-U-T-T-A is uh, Sutta. That's uh, Sutra is the, is the, um, the Sanskrit. So if you say Kalama is spelled right, yeah, yeah. Here I'll I'll give you links to that. Let me let me provide you guys with the links here. Here you go, and I'll actually I'll actually highlight the part for you. It's a, it's said in Sutta speak. So if you're not familiar with the suttas. So suppose there is a hereafter, and there is fruit. Fruit is vipaka. Fruit is the result of past kama or karma. So this is stuff that comes. This is basically the the effect of a previous cause. So there is fruit. There is result of deeds done, well or ill. Then it is possible that the dissolution of the body after death, I shall arise in the heavenly world, which is possessed with a state of bliss. Suppose there is no hereafter, there is no fruit, no result, no deeds, no de so no karma, no rebirth. No Suppose there's nothing. Yet in this world, here and now, free from hatred, free from malice, safe and sound and happy, I keep myself. How can you be? be how how can you live a better life than that, huh? That's the way I look at it. How can how can you live a better life than that? Safe, free from hatred, free from malice, safe and sound. Sounds good to me. <laughs> and actually, that kind of echoes um, the verse from the Dhammapada, where it goes, um, Happy we are amongst those who are craving. You know, um, peaceful we are among those who are anger, who are angry. That's what this practice brings to you. And I seem to always, no matter what topic it is, I always seem to start yammering on about the practice. But <laughs> that's because they're all connected. <laughs> it's all connected to the practice. And if you start to read the suttas, and you start to kind of understand what the Buddha was trying to say, you see that. And that's why so many teachers basically teach that way. You know, who I would consider my teachers, uh, in parentheses, some of them, because some of them I've never met. <laughs> but um, Ajahn Brahm, Venerable Yuta Dhammo, here, who teaches here. Um, you know, I've never met any of them. They all, all their teachings, while some of it is different in terms of methodology of meditation, they all teach the same exact stuff with what the Buddha taught for the most part teachers that I do know, that I have learned under. Uh, Bonte G says the same stuff. You know, um, the different monastics of Bhavana Society, which is the place that I go to. So for me, it all makes sense because it's all, I have multiple sources telling me the same thing, that this is what the Buddha said. And of course also that I can go to the suttas themselves and say, yeah, this is what the Buddha said. I can read it right here. So there's not a lot of a lot of frustration or or worry or anxiety for me over these things like uh, rebirth, reincarnation, rebecoming, however you want to say it. There's not a lot of anxiety because in the end it doesn't really matter whether it's true or not. Only thing that matters is right here, right now, and that's the right here right now is how you create your future whether it's your future five minutes from now 
or whether it's your future 60 years from now or whether it's your future 10 lifetimes from now right here right now is how you create your future that's the most important thing so I believe I owed you guys some Ian Stevenson links oh, wait, I got, gave you that now <clears throat> I bought the one that I bought um, was actually over Kindle, so it was cheaper. It was only 16 bucks, but in paperback, I don't know if it's because it's a limited edition or it's not sold much. It, it's actually like 40 so I don't know if you really want to spend that much. But I, I definitely, if you want to just get a cursory glance without going too much into the scientific, boring, dry stuff, get the, uh, the book that I linked the first time will go through a lot of it. It's really interesting. And plus you learn about Ian Stevenson himself. He's an interesting character, this guy. You know, this, this is somebody who took a topic that seemingly normal scientific people, you know, would would not be able to study or would not want to study. And he studied it to the best that he could. So it's an, it's an interesting thing. So, I guess I'll, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Those of you who've heard me talk, you know I kind of don't, I don't come with a, with a outline. I come with basically, okay, I'm going to talk about this topic. That's pretty much what the monks do, right? This is the monks, how they train themselves to be able to talk. So that you're talking out of what you know, not talking out of what you can think of. So any comments or questions at this point? And it is the uh, the half hour mark. Usually I open it up to comments and questions and then something else pops into my head and I start yammering on. <laughs> but what about anybody else's history or anything like that? Any feelings about reincarnation slash rebirth slash... You know, in all reality, in everyday life, it's all about... Uh, wording right it, it's you know reincarnation rebirth rebecoming it's semantics in a lot of ways but you don't want it's just so that you don't confuse what the buddhist what buddha taught as opposed to what other traditions who you know talk about reincarnation taught changes one's view of responsibility like holy crap I have to come back to this planet so I should probably do something good with it <laughs> but you know what though uh -uh. the Buddha taught about the world systems and this is where people say well if there's a reincarnation then how come there's more humans blah blah blah, blah. well so the, the easy one is that people say well it's because there's less animals which is true but the Buddha taught about world systems. So, we're not only talking about Earth. We're talking about a universe full of planets and life. It's an amazing thing to me about what I started listening, reading the suttas and learning about what the Buddha taught about. The world systems. There's a sutta um, where he describes something out in the, in the universe that sounds remarkably like a black hole. It's interesting when he says, yeah, so, you know, <laughs> so you might not come back on this planet. You never know. You might go to another planet. Who knows? But, <laughs> but no, I, I, I agree, though, because it kind of, but you know what also I, I, what I like about it, and somebody's, I was trying to, what, what was it that I was, basically, it gives you chances it makes sense to me in that you have many lifetimes to figure out how to do the right thing and to get out. <laughs> if you screw up, that's okay. You know, you just keep coming back. There's no, there's no finite 
you know, you have one life and then you either go to heaven or hell for eternity. Even, you know, in the cosmology, yeah, there's heaven realms, there's hell realms in Buddhism. But even these heaven and hell realms don't last forever. Nothing lasts forever, period. Heaven realms, hell realms, hungry ghost realms, uh, shores realms, etc. Nothing lasts forever. What, you mean life right now as a human? According to Buddhism, no. Not really. Because according to Buddhism, the human life is the best life to practice Dhamma. It is the life that has the is, is the middle way. Has just the, the right amount of suffering and happiness to understand. You can't really practice Dhamma as as a human. I mean as a as an animal. And if you do and if you go into the heavenly realms, you know, you can't really practice Dhamma. You can practice Dhamma there, but it's not really the best. You know, so the human realm, uh, hum, being a human, according to the Buddha, is the most blessed rebirth because it gives you that chance to practice. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. The right amount of hell and heaven. You know, it gives you that chance to practice. And so, being coming back as a human is very important. Now, see, I, I remember one of, one of my talks. I was at Bhavana Society, and we were talking about it. And, and I got worried about this, this because if you're familiar with a sotapanna, which is a stream winner, right? The stream winner is when you become when you get to this point where you only have seven lifetimes left. And if you get to this point, and if you die without becoming a once returner or a non returner, you can go to the heaven realms. Oh, that sounds nice, right? But if you if you want to go to enlightenment, the heaven realms is like crap. <laughs> because you're you 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 can't really you have more lifetimes to go and going into a heaven realm is eons. So instead of having you know going through a couple of human lives where you live for 70, 80 years, going to the heaven realm is like you're stuck there for aeons. And it's like, oh, crap. <laughs> now I got all these extra lives and I'm going to be here forever. So so I said to um, Bhante Silananda, he's the one who told me this, and I said, well, dang it, I better become a what's returner <laughs> before I die because I sure as heck don't want to go into the heaven realms. <laughs> I, I don't want to... Um, well, I mean, if you become a once returner, they, they say then you can go into the heaven realms and you be, can become enlightened from there. But, you know, and this is all what is taught by the Buddha and what was taught. So, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But, you know, I, I sure... This is why, to me, I want to make the most of this life as a human. And I don't know if I could come back as a human again. I, I, I don't know. Different traditions kind of talk about... like I think in the Tibetan tradition, you can kind of choose... If you've practiced enough and this and that, you can say, I want to come back as a human, and you come back as a human. Theravada tradition doesn't it says you can't really do that. It's kind of, I mean, you can live a great life, and, you know, a very virtuous life, and old karma can come back and smack you in the face, and you can co go back as like a dog and stuff like that. So it's kind of a little bit more random than Theravada. So, I don't know. <laughs> I, I kind of in this in this uh, instance I'd rather go with the Tibetans and say yeah I'm gonna come back as a human no problem <laughs> but um, let's see I want to go back on the comments okay see as a kid I always like you know you know what. Ah, well, <laughs> there's a difference. There's a difference between um, how my family feels about Buddhism and how my family feels about me becoming a monk. <laughs> there's a difference there. Um, they, you know, pretty much everybody in my life has accepted that I'm a Buddhist. 
Uh, the acceptance of me becoming a monk is kind of half and half. And, and I have a, a libertus spelled it right. T-H-E-R-A-V-A-D-A -A -A means teachings of the elders. It is the most quote-unquote orthodox of the Buddhist traditions. And the oldest. Sometimes people say it is the tr the closest to the original teachings of the Buddha. Which is eh, kind of true, kind of not. There's no tradition alive today that is the exact teachings of the Buddha. Other than just what we have in the four Nikayas, which is the four parts of the suttas that are the oldest. But um, going back to growing up and acceptance in Buddhism and all that, I, uh, there's something in me, you know what, it, and you know what it was, I always, even today, I kind of feel this like, I wish I was alive to see what it, life would be like in 500 years. I always, I, it kind of saddens me in a way when I think about that I will not be alive to see us go into other planets outside this solar system. I'll be lucky by the time I die if I see us go to Mars. <laughs> you know, so so th this is my thought as a child, like thinking, you know, that kind of sucks. <laughs> I kind of want to come back, and I want to be able to see this, you know, or I want to live forever, right? You know, I want to see these kind of things. <laughs> you know what? I saw that one-way trip thing, <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it, believe me, it's tempting. <laughs> One one of the things that I'd like to do, if possible, um, is to actually one of the things that I have on my bucket list per se is to be in space before I die. I'd love to do that. Maybe it could be the first monk in space. That would be kind of neat. <laughs> I'm thinking by the time I'm old, uh, you know, it'll be pretty easy for people to just go up into space or at least orbit. It's technically not space, but. Um, going back to when I was so I always had these this desire because I always wanted to keep coming back right and uh, seeing what was new because I thought it was kind of interesting and, and I saw the movie and it, that kind of always conflicted with my you know growing up Catholic where it's there's heaven and hell right and then I saw this movie that connected with me I'm like yeah why can't it be like this that movie was a universally hated movie, but I like it. It's called What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams. And although it's he it's it's Catholic or Christian and that there's a heaven and a hell and all that, in the end, they get reborn. They choose to come back. And I said, well, dang it, I like that. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, so the, I've always had this connection. Now... The more I practice and the more I kind of start seeing things as they truly are and the more I read what the Buddha taught, I say, like, oh, hell, I don't want to come back. That guy, I mean, it really thinks about it. You're like, as I grew up, you know, I'm growing up, I've started to experience, you know, um, what life is like, what life is about. You know, I was married. My wife died seven years of cancer. I've witnessed a lot of death in my life. I've witnessed, and stuff like what the Buddha said about, Throughout our travels in samsara, we have uh, cried more tears than all than all the water and all the great oceans. And I thought to myself, you know what? Hell, that's friggin' true. Why would I want to come back again and go through losing everybody that I've ever loved again? And getting old and getting sick and dying. Why the hell would I want to keep coming back over and over and over and over? So my, <laughs> so my childhood illusions of wanting to come back are kind of shattered at that point. Now it's like, yeah, I don't feel like coming back. I'm good. <laughs> I'll go for enlightenment in this life. That'll work. If it doesn't work, eh, whatever. But so yeah, that that's kind of my background slash history with rebirth. It's always just kind of fit into my worldview. It's always made sense to me. And finding Theravada is kind of like really fitting into my worldview. It almost feels like I was born to be a Theravada Buddhist. Because it makes the most sense. I had this worldview that didn't fit with the worldview of the society around me. 
so it never clicked. And I never found anything else that clicked in my early years. It wasn't until... <clears throat> I'm 35 now, so it wasn't until age 27, 28 that I found Theravada Buddhism. And I had known about Buddhism in general for years before that. It wasn't until I found Theravada, I was like, oh, wow, yeah, this this fits. This is perfect. And it's like my worldview that I always had fit like a piece in a puzzle. So for me, while I can't necessarily say that I believe in rebirth, reincarnation, it f fits me and it feels right. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Well, there's actually a lot of different traditions. <laughs> there's many, many traditions. Um, the Tibetan is called the Vajrayana. Uh, Vajrayana, depending on who you talk to, is considered either the third type of Buddhism, or third major tradition, or is considered one of, part of the second tradition, which is Mahayana. M-A-H-A-Y-A-N-A. The Mahayanas were really like the, the first break, the first split, going way back to like, I think, a, a hundred years after the Buddha's time. So we're talking 2,500 years ago. Um, they were the first split from, yes, the schism. Uh, and they kind of moved into, so modern day what we have is Mahayana Buddhism is found in China, Japan, um, all like that northern Asia and Theravada is found in um, Thailand, speci most specifically Thailand and Sri Lanka, but also in Laos, Burma. So, and obviously Tibetan Buddhism is pretty much exclusively found in Tibet. Um, for now. <laughs> Depending on what happens. But anyway. Um, so this is the, the different traditions. And they all have the same kind of core. Uh, a lot of the tradi a lot of the differences come from the cultures that Buddhism merged with, as it, you know, traveled as it spread, um, and different beliefs on a variety of different things. But the core teachings of the Buddha are in every tradition, which is good. I mean, that, that's the one great thing that you can say, is that those core teachings are there. How they're taught and the philosophies of what they are and all of this stuff changes depending on the tradition. And that's why, if you're coming to Buddhism for the first time, it's good to learn about all the different traditions, how they view things, all this kind of stuff. Um, but to full, more fully understand those differences, the best thing to do is to learn the very basics. And by the very basics, we're talking about the Four Noble Truths. We're talking about the Noble Eightfold Path. We're talking about dependent origination. Those are the three core teachings. So if you under, come to understand those, then you can kind of see where the differences lie. So I think there's a couple comments. If anybody has any other comments or questions, um, I think I'm going to spell Vajrayana wrong. So <laughs> if some, if one of you guys knows how to spell it right, please uh, tell me. Vajrayana. I th I'm pretty sure that's how it's spelled. Um, <laughs> and uh, Mahayana. There. <clears throat> Under Mahayana, you have the, the Soto, the Zen. Zen is very famous. Um, the Chan, you know, all of those different ones you have are under the Mahayana body, pure land. Yes. So let's see. Scrolling back. Scrolling back. Is there soul travel in Dhamma? Well, there's no... See, in Buddhism, there is the denial of 
a permanent self. It's called that in Buddhism, everything, all conditioned things, have three characteristics. They are that um, they are impermanent. Impermanence means that things are always changing. They never stay the same. That they are born. They grow old. They die. They arise. They fall. That is impermanence. N nothing, everything is in constant flux. Which is interesting because if you know anything about astrophysics and you start getting into string theory and the multiverse and all that, it's kind of amazing how what the Buddha taught 2,600 years ago fits with science today. But anyway, that's going off on a little bit of a tangent. So that's impermanence. The second one is dukkha. Dukkha is simply, um, it's often translated as suffering, but it's not really the best translation of, of the word because it's not really, it doesn't fit everything. Dukkha is basically not understanding that things are impermanent so we attach to things we crave things we want it and because we don't understand that things are always changing when those things that we like go away we we you know we lose our family our loved ones they die um we lose our spouse they die or they just say well, i don't want to be with you anymore and they leave um, we have a nice sports car and it crashes and we lose it. This is <laughs> this is dukkha. This is um, separation from what is beloved. This is being having to deal with things we don't like. This is dukkha. And the third thing is anatta or not self. And this is not saying different traditions and different ways of saying it. Uh, of, of talking about not self say like that because there's no self that exists there's nothing there is a self kind of existing right now as a consequence of causes and conditions in the past and as you look deeper into the reality of how things really are you come to see that there's no permanent self there's no ego there's no I there's no me behind it all all it is is causes and conditions and all anything that we think that we are which are the five aggregates the form so this is all the body anything that any the body the organs the sense organs all that that's form our feelings feelings is not like emotions feelings is being able to sense things to to come in contact with things, form feelings, um, perceptions, mental formations, these are thoughts, mental volitional thoughts, thoughts of will, and consciousness. So what all we are is in those five, um, I'm saying khandas, and I forgot the traditional, the English translation, five, um, I want to say hindrances, but it's not... <laughs> Five. Somebody help me because I forgot. Uh, I'm going blank. And I just said it too. Aggregates. That's it. Thank you. Uh, the five aggregates. The the Pali word is kanda. I, I'm say the more I get into the Pali, the more I keep saying kandas. Uh, you know, Pali words. So all of these five aggregates are nothing but the elements. And in Buddhism, the elements are earth water wind fire you know you can expand on that today and talk about the, the periodic table and all the different elements and stuff like that they all really come from this earth water wind fire so basically what it's saying is while <clears throat> there are these these conditions that created this cause that comes to think that we are this permanent being this is I am Jayantha I am Ferox, I am Joe, which is what I'm called in quote unquote real life, whatever. You know, this is me, I am this person. But when you start to practice meditation and you start to see deeper, you start to question that, like, yeah, it doesn't quite seem that way. You know, and I, I'm by no means very far in this practice. 
I, you know, this is why I say I'm no master, I'm no guru, I'm, you know, I'm no uh, wandering mystic that has, you know, deep meditation insight. So there's, I'm not, I'm not very far in this practice. But as far as I am, I can see the ego, the self, starting to unravel. So. And, you know, just at the very beginning parts of it, I still don't, you know, the, the, I still don't know and see that there is not a not self, or else I wouldn't still be suffering. I'm still suffering. So, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> you, got, you know, you can only keep practicing. That's all you can do. So, that's really a, a short layman's kind of explanation of what they what we mean by there's no soul now how it's been explained to me in terms of well then kind of what goes to the next body is that what we think we are all of these these mental processes are part of this consciousness called the citta c i t t a <coughs> which is also the poly word for mind so it's kind of like this this mind consciousness and when we die there's this final consciousness but then there's this what they call I said in the beginning this relinking consciousness because we have continual craving because we are not done with this world because we want to come back because we crave things we crave um, you know sensual things we crave sights, sounds, smells, taste, tangibles, thoughts. We crave these things. We don't want to leave. It's kind of like how I was, I was talking, how I was as a child, where it's like, you know, oh, I kind of want to come back and see this. I, kind of, I want to come back. I'd like to have a, a wife again. I'd like to uh, live a life again, have kids again, all these kind of things. I want to keep doing this. So the, it, it's all these thoughts, this craving that keeps us coming back and it's not until the eradication of that craving that there is no further rebirth there is no further coming back and that's enlightenment you know you are a, you are freed from what they call the round of becoming or otherwise known as samsara this wheel of rebirth that we are stuck in because of our craving and because of our ignorance because we don't understand the true nature of reality. So we're pretty stuck in that. And this is what, you know, the story of the Buddha, just real as a real quick aside, because we are kind of getting close to the end. Um, you know, supposedly the Buddha is a prince, and he was raised that he, he didn't know anything. He didn't know what old age was. He didn't know what death or what illness was. He didn't know what death was. And, and it, the story goes on about how in his 29th year, even though the, his father, who wanted him to be a king, tried to keep him from seeing all these things, he starts to see them. He starts to see old age, sickness, and death. And he says to myself, and he says to himself, what? I don't want to keep doing that. And isn't there a way out? Are, are all the people that I love doomed to keep coming back? and going through these sufferings over and over and over and over. So he says, there has to be a way. For myself and for all beings, I'm going to find a way. And so he went into the, four, you know, the fourth sight that he saw was a monk. And he says, oh, I, this guy seems happy. He doesn't have anything. What the, what's going on with him? I'm going to be, you know, follow what he does. So he cut his hair and he, be, he went into the forest and he became in this, uh, you know, what we would consider today a monk. So, really, the whole the whole story behind the reasoning of going for enlightenment was to stop the cycle of rebirth. So, if somebody says well, the Buddha didn't teach rebirth, or reincarnation, or becoming, uh, it's not quite a hundred percent true. I mean, it, it really, you know, the Buddha was a product of his environment. 
and in his environment long before Buddhism and Hinduism even long before Hinduism there was that belief in reincarnation so it's not something that he made up or it's not something that he brought that was new to the scene he taught from that cultural um, belief from that concept of rebirth so I guess we have a few minutes left any last comments questions your own feelings on rebirth you know I one thing I always do say that always gets people to laugh but as a kid I thought to myself you know heaven sounds pretty freaking boring I mean you you go there for an eternity and you know like whatever it sounds like a boring place to me that's another reason I was like well, why would I want to be in heaven what do you, you stay up there with the angels and God and and for your family and stuff for eternity what do you do you know how how much you know how much time before you've done everything a million times and you're bored, right? <laughs> so I was like, I want to come back. That sounds interesting. <laughs> you know, and you know, going going from science, even even science, kind of fits. Yeah, I agree, Libertus. I agree. <laughs> Science kind of fits into that too. Like, what, what did Albert Einstein say? Where one of his things uh, when he talked about energy, right? And this is energy is very um, a very core part of Buddhism too, in terms of you know what is what is our contact between our senses. Like, what is hearing? What is sound? Sound is energy moving through the air right heat what is heat what is cold it's all energy and Albert Einstein says that energy is never destroyed it is only put into a different form yeah so there you go it's kind of interesting right what are we so can we be created or destroyed? That's interesting. I, so that's another thing that kind of fits to me. Is like, yeah, that makes sense. It kind of makes sense. But you know, th this is my own feelings and beliefs. It shouldn't be, you know, yours. What you have your own feelings and beliefs, and no matter what our feelings and beliefs are. It doesn't matter because practice is the most important. Okay, <laughs> I had to add that in at the last. <laughs> like I always do. Always, always, always. Practice. Practice is the most important. The, the closest thing I've ever experienced to what I would consider a heaven is <clears throat> my mind being quiet for minutes on end. Having that blissful peace to me, that's the closest thing I, that I know of as a heaven. Sitting at peace with all things let go. Just being in the moment. With your mind calm. That's heaven. Sound of the Big Bang. All you have to do is go to a channel that uh, that doesn't have anything going, and there's and that's the sound of the Big Bang right there. Yeah, the sound of microwave. Although, with astrophysics today, you might you will say this is the sound of a Big Bang. Because according to the multiverse, and those of you who do my, who come to my meta meditations on Thursday, you know, what do I? What's the last thing I do after giving meta to the universe? We give meta to the multiverse, all the universes and all the planes of existence, and all beings in all of those universes.
Okay, friends. Well, it is 7 slash 10 o'clock for me slash whatever time it is for you guys. <laughs> so, oh, wait. Let's see if there's any last... No, okay. <laughs> so, until next time, friends. Much meta to you all. Suki Hantu. May you be happy. Uh, I sh should be here on Thursday if I'm still alive and I'm not working late <laughs> to do the meta meditation. Who knows? So, as we all know, all things, all things are uncertain. We could be gone tomorrow. This is why the best thing to do is practice. <laughs>